Hello and welcome. I'm really impressed that there's so many of you here given tonight's weather is as bad as a blizzard. Um, I don't know if you got, I had to go home and change before I came because I was so wet. And because um, I stepped out of my car at the wrong moment. Um, anyhow, I'm Freddie Gillespie and I'm the chair of the South Burr Open Space Preservation Commission and we're hosting this presentation tonight. And I want to give a short intro, I'm trying to keep it short, it's tough because there's so much fascinating information that relates to this topic because it's ever expanding and just like the web of life, it's all connected. So our Open Space Preservation Commission has embarked on a new initiative called Native Pollinators, Native Plants. And then um, we've been working on pollinator, uh, we've had caterpillar labs, we've had butterfly walks, we've had several talks here at the library, um, we worked with the stewardship committee on creating uh, several pollinator gardens at Breakneck Hill Conservation Land. And we decided to come out and formalize this effort because the situation is dire. We're losing insects, not just pollinators, but all insects. And the consequences, I can't state enough how severe it is. A study in Europe said they've lost 75, 78% of their insects in the past 25 years. That's a lot. And if you can remember, when I was a child, and even when I was maybe a teenager, pulling over and my dad would go to the gas station and you know this, the, the car windshield wiper thing? Mm -hmm. Using that to scrape the bugs off your windshield when you drove down the road in the summer. When was the last time you had to scrape the bugs off your windshield unless you were up in you know, the north woods somewhere? That's because there are fewer and fewer insects. And the ongoing consequence of that is incredible. 97% of our birds feed their young insects. Even seed-eating birds need insects to feed the babies. So, all connected. Why am I talking about insects when we're talking about pollinators and hummingbirds? Well, one, pollinators are insects, right? And two, we're talking about native plants, and that's a whole new topic. Um, I shouldn't say it's a new topic, but it's really, really coming out. It's not even, you know, you might think it's a fad. It's not. It's based on science. And this book here, Bringing Nature Home, it's like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. It's a wake-up call. And if you haven't read it, I think every person should own a copy, but our library has a copy and you can borrow it. It gives the science of why native plants are critical for our pollinators and for the whole web of life. And if you look at the pyramid of life, you know, we have humans up here. The bottom line is insects. And if that collapses, everything else is tumbling down too. He paints a good picture. He's an entomologist and he's a professor in Maryland, Delaware. 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 And um, 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 he's fascinating. I've heard him talk. If you Google his name on YouTube, you can catch, you know, interviews with him. I can't state enough. Bringing nature home, Doug Tallamy, right? How do you spell his last name? T A L L A M Y. And the library has a copy of it. You can keep it here. I mean, you can get it here, but you should have one at home. Um, another thing, this is not part of my commission's work, but it's a group that I, um, a Facebook group, if you're on Facebook. How many people in the room are on the Southboro Native Plant Garden group? If you're on Facebook, search for it, because I can't add people unless you ask to join, and ask to join. I'll double check the name of it, because I made it up. I think it's Southboro. <laughs> Native, Native plants garden garden of, of Southboro. Yeah. Put those words in, you'll find it. But at the end, I'll look it up. I'm sorry. I just don't, I go to it every day. I should know. But um, we we providing lots of information, and we're hoping um, one of the goals of the Native open space. Plant. Native plant gardens of Southboro. Native plant gardens of Southboro. Somebody's <laughs> looking at it right now. So we're hoping to create a larger community. And our goal from the Open Space Commission 
is to encourage people to plant more native plants in their yard by attraction. And it's not, you can't have any non-natives unless they're invasive, then they have to go. But, you know, if you're looking to purchase or bring more plants into your yard, think native first. And one of the problems is we're so aware of the pretty um, European and, you know, gardens from elsewhere, and people don't, aren't even aware of how gorgeous our own native plants are. That's one of the things you'll be able to see if you go to Breakneck Hill and look at those. They're going to be interpreted at some point. Right now you can go and see the flowers. They're not, they're not tagged, but you going over some of those tonight? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh. Ellen here has been working with us for, I don't know, over three years? About three, three years. And she helped design the garden. So she's worked hand in hand with the stewardship committee. She's been absolutely awesome and really sorry I didn't the rain caught me off guard. She wrote this book, and she has a few available for sale. She's a garden designer. She's a garden coach. You're a steward at New England Wildflower Society? Overseer. An overseer yeah. at New England Wildflower Society. Um, garden in the Woods? Yeah, New England Wildflower Society. Yeah. Yep. So, if I said that wrong? Well, Garden in the Woods is a botanic garden. Well, okay. And that's the other thing I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to talk about is that... Um, we're very fortunate. Who here has been to Garden in the Woods in Framingham? I think that's 100%. Yay. We are so lucky to have it nearby. Sometimes I hear people like, oh, where do I go? Oh, that's so far away. It's just down the road. Um, it's an amazing resource. They just put out a great book, Native Plants for New England Gardens. And it's by um, two of the employees at Garden in the Woods. Moon Moon Wildflower Society, uh, Mark Richardson and Dan Jaffe. Really great book, and what this is is native plants that would be good for a garden. So now we're talking about not just natural landscapes, but for your backyard garden, which plants, and um, the information they give, as you can tell, this is my copy. It's all wrinkled and, you know, and I only added a little bit of time. Another book they have there, Ted Elliman from New England Wildflower Society. This is, if you're more apt to be out in the woods and you want to identify a native plant or a wildflower, um, is it native, you know, what is that? This is great, beautiful pictures, and it's by color, so if you're not really good at keying it out like me, it can kind of look to the color, and I actually used it and started getting good at, you know, how many petals it has in purple, and then I couldn't, because I'm not that scientific um, as much as I'd like to be. The other point I wanted to make is, all these books here, aside from Ellen's book, um, these are newer books available at Garden in the Woods. The, the movement is taking off. It's a new way of gardening. Um, which one? Planting in a post-wild world. Really good information. The High Line in New York City. Amazing work. Different way of gardening. Looking at these pictures like, um, you may not want to be planting meadows, but if you have a little area, do you have a little area that might make a small meadow? Or even just making a small native plant traditional perennial garden. We're working on one with Carol um, at the Senior Center. Ellen just helped design it. We'll be showing that, and you haven't even seen it yet, but the plan is awesome. And I wanted to say, this is gardening for butterflies. So, all of these books are amazing, native plants, but you have to also be aware of what you're trying to do, the right plant in the right place, but also, is it native here? So you can read a book about native plants, but they're talking about prairie native, they're talking about you know, native uh, south of here or the west coast, so you wanna check. Even in a good book, they may use some natives and some non-natives, and you know, it's okay to make that choice if it's a planned decision. So what I always do when I choose a plant, I check, and there's a, this awesome resource, it's called Go Botany, G-O-B-O-T-A-N-Y. Go Botany. And you can also find a link from New England Wildflower Society, <coughs> it's their database. You put a plant name in, and then if, if it doesn't come up at all, you know, it's probably not native, but they will, have a map and it will show if it's native or if it's regional and then it will show the whole country and show where it is and if it's purple it means 
it's not native, um, but it's here. So if you find a plant you really want and you go and you put it there and you find out it's not native, now you can make an informed decision. So go botany, I can't say enough about um, New England Wildflower Society, Garden in the Woods. I mean, we have these amazing resources. So, oh, and warning, do not go to Garden in the Woods <coughs> plant shop without a plan and a list because you can't buy one of everything. <laughs> and after a trip there, you may want to. So let me turn it over to Ellen, who's going to talk about the uh, butterfly and hummingbird gardens. Yep. And the hummingbirds are here now, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. And as much, I will say this, as much as it's wonderful to see them at your feeders, nothing can compare to seeing them on your own plant in your garden. So Alan's going to talk about how to do that. Okay. Thank you, Freddie, for that nice intro. I'm, I, I totally agree with Freddie on the Douglas Tallamy book, Bringing Nature Home. I mean, he really, you, this, this is a book that will make you look at your backyard in a totally different way. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of his research. Um, but thanks for having me here. Um, I am from Spencer. We live in Spencer, um, which is out in the middle of nowhere in central Mass. Um, we are a, a small farm. We're a certified wildlife habitat through the National Wildlife Federation. Um, we are a monarch way station, which means that we supply resources for monarch butterflies um, in their time that they spend in New England. Um, we're also registered as a pollinator habitat through the Xerces Society. Um, and I do garden coaching, garden design. Um, I have a small native plant nursery um, at our farm that I am hoping to open for retail um, within the next year or two. Um, but I'm here to, I'll be talking about native plants. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, I, what native plants are, what they're not. Um, and I'm going to talk, uh, I'll, I'll talk about why native plants are so important ecologically. Um, and then I am going to introduce a number of native plants, um, mostly perennials, um, some shrubs. Um, I'm not going to touch trees and, and, or small trees, um, otherwise I'll be here all night. I really have to cut a lot of um, plants out of this presentation just to, so that I don't keep you here till midnight tonight. Um, but uh, talking about native plants, what I, um, the definition that I, that I operate under is native plants being the plants that were growing here um, in this country, in this part of the world, when the colonists arrived, before the European colonists arrived in the 1600s. Um, they share, those native plants, they share an evolutionary history with insects and other forms of wildlife. Um, that the plants that are introduced, um, introduced plants are plants that are brought here, have been brought here um, by people, either by boat, on planes, in nursery stock, etc. Um, and that would include a lot of our food plants, many of our, um, many of our edible plants, herbs, culinary herbs, and ornamentals. Um, naturalized plants are plants that were introduced here, so they're not native, um, but they are plants that have actually started, begun to, to spread into the wild, that they, you know, they've been um, seen spreading into, into wild areas, but not over aggressively. Then there are the exotic, the non-native, foreign invasive plants, and those are the worst of the lot. Those are the ones that have been brought here what, for whatever reason, deliberately or, act, or accidentally, um, and those are the plants that spread uncontrollably into wild areas and um, generally crowd out native plants at the same time. So those are the worst of the worst. Um, an example of that would be the bitter, Asiatic bittersweet vine, um, purple loose strife, which you see growing in wetlands across New England. Um, those are what I, what I mean by non-native invasive plants. Um, so native plants, um, I know Freddie has already talked a little bit about why they are so important, the ecological, um, the ecological compelling reasons for, for using natives. Um, there are a number of reasons, um, but w one of them actually is a, from a gardener's point of view is that they, they actually are adapted to the climate here. They are plants that grow here in their own microclimate, in the soils, in the, in the, in the crazy weather that we have here in New England. Um, and as, if they're planted in the, if they're growing in their natural habitat, then they don't need any help from us. They don't need to be watered, et cetera. They're quite happy to, to live here. Um, native plants also giving us a sense of place. Bl native plants, um, the sugar maples, the golden rods in the fall, the asters, et cetera. Those are all plants that really speak to, this is New England. This is not Minnesota. This is not California. These are plants that belong here. Um, they belong in, in our landscape. Um, and then the, th the third reason, which I will be spending 
the rest of the talk um, discussing is that they, native plants, support most forms of native wildlife. Um, and when I'm talking about native wildlife, I'm not talking about bears and coyotes and foxes. I'm really talking about those insects, those, those, little, um, those little members of the food chain that are so important. Um, including pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, I do do a lot of talks for garden clubs. Um, and some, sometimes I'll come into a, a garden club talk and I'll start right off by telling people, um, I really want you to, to encourage you to garden for insects. Now, I don't always get met with a very enthusiastic reaction to that kind of concept. Um, and I get that people, you know, we're kind of conditioned not to like bugs, not to like insects, the mosquitoes, the ticks, et cetera, wasps. Um, but the fact is that most of the insects that are flying around um, in our environment, in our backyards, et cetera, most of them are not harmful to us. They don't sting, they don't bite. Some of them do sting, but they won't sting unless they're provoked. Um, and we have, and, and, and most of them perform some kind of beneficial function. Um, in terms of you know pollination, we have number we have um, something like about 400 species of native bees um, just in New England alone. Um, uh, butterflies, the pollinators, other beneficial insects. Um, some of them, many of them are pollinators. Many of them are also predatorial insects um, or parasitic insects. So they prey upon pests. They prey upon caterpillars and garden pests, and they eat mosquitoes and, and insect eggs, etc. Um, so the vast majority of those insects out there are, are, are insects that do a really good job. They, we need them. Um, uh, and what those insects need, in most cases, um, in the majority of cases, is they need those native plants. Now there are a number of reasons why, um, how insects um, use native plants for their own benefit. Um, host plants is, is one example, um, a host plant, but many butterfly caterpillars, um, Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, they um, they, their caterpillars are adapted, they've evolved over, over millennia, um, they've adapted to only be able to eat certain plants um, in, their, in their larval stage. A great example of that is the monarch butterfly. Um, you're probably familiar, you probably heard about monarchs and, and that their, their caterpillars can only eat milkweed plants. Um, Asclepius is the, is the species, is the, the genus. Um, uh, but there's an example of, and, and monarch, Butterflies are not the only ones that need um, milkweed plants. Um, there's a whole host of um, co-adapted species, um, insect species that also use milkweed. Um, this is a, a milkweed tussock moth. You can kind of tell from the orange and black markings that it's um, a milkweed feeder. Um, there's also milkweed bugs, milkweed beetles, et cetera. They all have that kind of orange and black marking. Um, but a whole host, for every single native plant out there, you're going to find this whole list of insects that, that rely upon those plants in the landscape for their, for their survival, for their ability to reproduce. Another example, um, there's a certain type of aster, tall white aster is the name of it. Um, and that is the only host plant for Harris, or that is one of the very few host plants that the Harris's checker spot butterflies will use. Without those plants, the butterflies simply can't, re they, they won't exist in, in, a certain, in an area. Um, violets. Now violets are kind of a funny plant. You either love them or hate them. People tend to not like them very much because they kind of creep into lawns and they can sort of take over where, if they're in a really happy place. Um, but violets are actually um, the sole host plant for several types of fritillary butterflies. Um, which, and, and, and they, they, those butterflies, they lay their eggs in the vicinity of violet plants. And those, the caterpillars, they need those violets to survive. Um, violets are one of those plants I call a, a, a useful weed. Um, I have a certain, I have this purple violet that grows on my property and I've, I've been using it actually, it's, it, it, it's pretty aggressive, it's very happy there, but I tend to use it, I'll use it um, to line my veggie beds, etc. Um, so uh, these specialist relationships exist for, so, for almost every plant that you, native plant that, that you'll find out there. Uh, white turtle head, Chilone glabra is the botanic name for it. Um, that is the only host plant, or one of the very few host plants, for Baltimore checker spot butterflies. Um, and interestingly, this is uh, kind of a, just a, an interesting um, thing to note about the white turtle head is that the Harris's checker spot, the Baltimore checker spots, they use the, the New England native as the white turtle head. There is also a native pink turtle head that grows in the south. It does grow up here in New England. Um, but it is not used by that, by, that check, by that checker spot butterfly. So oftentimes, even if it's native to the south, it's still not recognized as a food source by, by insects here in the north. 
Um, evening primrose is another one. There's a um, co-adapted prim evening primrose moth. Um, and that's, there's a picture of it, this little, beautiful little pink moth here laying its eggs in the primrose flower. Um, uh, evening primrose are also pollinated by sphinx moths. Um, there's some, there are some small sweat bees that actually use the pollen just from this particular plant. Um, so all kinds of ways in which these plants support wildlife, support insects, specialist insects. Spice bush is another one that's, a, um, that's just finished blooming. Um, usually blooms in April, but it's very late this year. But that's a native shrub. You'll see it in, in kind of low woodlands areas. Um, it has yellow flowers in the spring. Um, also very, um, very high fat berries that are, that are produced for, for um, birds later in the year. Um, but spice bush is actually the, one of two host plants for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. Um, spice bush is a uh, spice bush is one of their host plants. The other one is sassafras. So it really is a case of if that if spice bush is in the area, the spice bush swallowtails they'll find it. Um, they're they're really cute caterpillars too. I find them. You see the caterpillar there. They have these. Um, if you could see the big eye markings on the caterpillar, um, those are not eyes. Those are actually just a camouflage to make them look. What they do is they fold leaves over themselves. Um, and 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 birds when they're feeding their babies will come and sort of glean glean out caterpillars and. I think the idea is that um, if they see these big eyes peering at them out, out, out of the, leaf, the folded leaves, they'll think it's a much bigger, they'll, they'll think it's a snake or something, you know, much less palatable. So um, the caterpillars have, have good camouflages to keep them from being eaten. And it's not just the insects that need the plants. It's, um, in a lot of cases, it's the plants that need specific insects in order to survive. This picture here, this is a, um, a, a native, an eastern native honeysuckle vine. Um, and you can see these long red tubular flowers are just the right width, they're just the right size and length to fit that long tongue of a hummingbird. Um, so it's primarily pollinated by hummingbirds. Um, so if, if humming were, hummingbirds were to disappear from the landscape, then probably these, the, the plant would too, without its co-adapted pollinator. Other examples of plants, um, of insects, um, of plants that need insects Certain types of insects are, um, there's a, a number of um, plants with flowers that are not pollinated efficiently by, by honeybees. Honeybees, just as an, as an aside, honeybees are not actually native insects. They, are, um, they were brought here from, from Europe um, by the colonists. Um, so they are not actually considered native, native species. But we have bumblebees. Um, bumblebees do something that honeybees can't do, other bees can't um, do. Uh, they do something called buzz pollination, in which they vibrate their flight muscles inside a flower, inside of a flower of a certain shape, and that um, that contributes to um, much more efficient pollination of those flowers. The, fla the, the picture on the left is blueberry. Those are blueberry flowers, and you can see um, those blueberries, um, tomatoes, peppers. Um, we have a lot of our non-native food plants actually rely on bumblebees for, for the most efficient pollination. Um, but certainly um, blueberries and cranberries being one of our native um, edible plants. They need those bumblebees um, in order to, <coughs> excuse me, in order to set fruit. Um, bumble pollinated plants often have kind of similar flower shape. Other natives that use bumble pollination is um, the native, um, this is the, the native dicentra, which is a, a type of, um, related to bleeding hearts. Um, that's Dutchman's breeches is the name of that. Solomon's seal. Um, those are other plants that use those bumblebees um, in order to, to, to produce their fruit. Um, pollen is another um, often specialized uh, food source that is used um, by insects, um, specifically bees most of the time. Um, native bees, um, many of them will only collect pollen from a certain type of plant. Now they, what they use, what most of those bees are using pollen for is to feed their young. They collect pollen and then they'll mix it with saliva and, and they'll, they'll use it to provision their nests. Those are solitary nesters. So they provide these little pollen balls um, into, um, into their nests so that when their babies hatch, they have, this is, this is what they eat until they're ready to emerge. Um, but, very, but interesting, um, research on this has actually been, is, is fairly new. Um, this is all kind of new information in terms of understanding those connections between certain plants and certain insects. A um, couple of years ago, um, this, there was a study done, I think it was by the USDA, um, Jared Fowler, he now works for the Xerces Society, but he was involved in that. And they did some, they, they, they um, studied um, uh, pollen specialists and bees and, and the plants that they were 
they were collecting pollen from. And they found, again, and this is, this is not a coincidence, that the top five of those pollen, of the plants that those pollen specialists um, were collecting pollen from, all of them native, um, top of the list was willow, willow trees. Um, very important plant for, for some of those specialized bees. Um, they will only collect pollen from, from those willow blossoms. Um, goldenrod is another one, the late summer bloomer. A lot of specialists use goldenrod pollen. Blueberry, cranberry, so the vaccinium genus. Um, sunflowers, the, the perennial sunflower, helianthus, also um, important for a lot of pollen, a lot of bees. And American aster. So these plants are, you know, there are a lot of ways in which native plants support those insects, um, that being is one of them. Um, now, Freddie mentioned Doug Tallamy in the book, and he, Doug Tallamy was an entomologist, and he and his students have done research on um, the number of um, caterpillars, so um, Lepidoptera caterpillars, Lepidoptera as being butterflies and moths. Um, and what they found was that native trees, in, they, they studied trees, and the native trees by far um, always attracted many, many more different species of, of Lepidoptera caterpillars that used those trees as a, as a as a host plant. Um, so what that means is if you have a, a, a landscape, and they compared that with non-native species, um, and they found, I mean, it was staggering. The top of the list they found on one single oak tree, they found well over 500 different Lepidoptera caterpillar species using that oak tree. Um, compared to the forsythia, the burning bush, the, you know, the, the Japanese yew, et cetera, the typical kind of landscaping plants that we have that are not native that we have in our gardens. And they've, sometimes they would find a couple of caterpillars on them, but, uh, more up, but usually very few. Um, so, you know, and then he made the connection between those caterpillars and the success of birds, of breeding birds. Um, baby insects, baby bird food. Um, so a, like a single, pair, a, a single pair of nesting bluebirds, this is a Tallamy statistic, um, if a single pair of nesting bluebirds, they'll be feeding their babies in the nest something like 300 caterpillars every day, which is a lot of caterpillars. Um, and they are probably getting most of those caterpillars from those native plants. Um, so again, um, if you have birds nesting, uh, like, a, like chickadees for example, um, they'll nest almost anywhere, but they need those, they, they'll be feeding thousands of caterpillars to their babies in the nest um, over the course of that, of that period of time that the babies are in the nest. Um, so, and, and so not, you know, um, if you have a landscape that doesn't have native plants in there, you may still find the birds, the birds will nest, they like to nest in forsythia and other twiggy shrubs, but if the parents then have to, um, feed their babies and they have to go further, they have to go find native plants that have all those caterpillars to feed their babies. Um, that's m a lot more risky for their babies. They have to travel further afield. They um, are leaving their babies um, open to predation. Um, so baby, uh, baby birds um, is, is probably, for me at least, probably the most compelling reason to actually plant natives um, is that you are supporting the health of those, of those babies and you're making it a lot easier for, for birds to feed their babies. Um, those caterpillars are, especially moth caterpillars, some of them are really big. Those are really good protein sources for, for baby birds. And it's not just for the baby birds. Um, a lot of insectivorous birds um, that, that don't come to seed feeders, um, the, like the, the um, scarlet tanager, a beautiful songbird that migrates into New England in the summertime. Um, you'll never find them at a seed feeder. You'll never see them. Where you'll find them is up in the oak trees, up in the, where the native trees are, because that's where the bugs are. That's where the food is. Um, so this is where we come in as gardeners, um, in that we, have a, we really have an opportunity to introduce a lot of these native plants into our gardens. And that can either be, you know, they, we can replace existing non-natives with natives and, and still you know, have an ornamental, um, you know, we, we can have ornamental gardens using native plants. Um, we can work on restoring the native habitat on our properties um, and still have them be beautiful, beautiful um, landscapes. But they will be beautiful not just to look at, but they will be beautiful in that they are supporting a lot of life um, simply by um, including those native plants in our landscapes. So, um, now, native plants, um, I, I don't want to leave this message that native plants, you buy a native plant, plunk it in the ground, it needs no maintenance at all. That's not true. Um, one, of the, one of the 
success factors in, in, in being a successful gardener is being able to look at the conditions that you have in your yard and find plants that actually want to live there. Find, find conditions and find plants that match those conditions that you have. Um, so you need to look at um, moisture retention, the soil, um, the drainage in the soil. There are some plants that will not tolerate having wet, living in wet soils or having wet feet. That's the moss flocks on the right here. That's a, a plant that really likes very well-drained soils. Um, soil fertility, the pH, most of our soils here are fairly acidic. Um, here in New England, there are pockets of, of alkaline soils, limestone soils, um, and there are plants adapted to, to all of those conditions. Um, um, moss, I mean, looking at your landscape, looking at if you have a landscape that looks like this with a lot of moss, um, that's telling you this is probably not a good place to be growing roses. Um, that's a shady, it's going to be damp, um, damp, acidic, and shady. Um, so those, that's, a, that's, a, that's a condition that you really want to, to make sure that you plant plants that are adapted to those conditions. Um, even different types of sun and shade. So from full blazing sun, full blazing sun throughout the day, um, to, to sun, springtime sun under deciduous trees. So right now, before the trees have fully leafed out, a lot of spring bloomers, or a lot of spring native plants that bloom before the trees leaf out, they're taking advantage of that, of that early spring sun. Um, and then that later, later on, um, the trees leaf out and they sort of, you know, they either grow dormant or, or kind of fade into the background. But spring sun under deciduous trees is, is, is definitely a great opportunity for introducing some native plants. Um, deep shade under evergreens, if you've ever tried to grow under pine trees or hemlock trees, you know there's, there's not a lot of plants that really like those conditions. But there are, there are native plants that will grow there. The, the lady slipper, if you've ever grown up with, with that plant, um, that's a, it's very finicky about where it grows, but that will grow under, um, under evergreen trees. And even the shade from buildings and structures. Um, North, north side of a building, um, that's, a, that's a certain type of shade. Sometimes actually that's easier to plant in than under trees because it doesn't, there are no tree roots usually to, to, um, to um, compete with. Um, so um, the interesting thing about living here in New England is that things want to grow. So even if you don't touch your, your property, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to show up on their own. Um, some of those are going to be invasive. By you know, uh, that's just a fact of life. A lot of those plant, a lot, a lot of the things that show up in your yard are going to be invasive plants that you don't want. But there will be natives that will either there, you know, they may be there waiting for an opportunity to grow, um, or they show up on their own. Um, and this is kind of this is this is the fun part of um, of gardening with natives. Is sometimes plants will show up on their own and. and you know, learning to recognize them and, and incorporate them into your landscaping. Um, the plant on the left is a bone set, which is a eupatorium. I never planted that. That's in a nice, that's in a border along a stream on our farm. Um, but it's, you know, and I, I happily, happy to incorporate that into, that into that border there. That plant wants to grow there. It's a great pollinator plant, great plant for birds too. Um, I mentioned the violet earlier. Um, I live on a farm, so we have some really tough areas next to the barns um, where the soil is just, you know, really rich and really difficult to grow. The violets seem to love it there, so I encourage that. You know, I'm using it. I, I I'm using it to um, to landscape. You know, so I, I always tell people try to try to learn ways to actually use your weeds, use those use those plants. Um, I, I like to call it selective weeding. So it's a lot easier than actually planting, digging holes and planting, but just waiting to see what shows up on its own. This, this area here is at the bottom of our driveway down by the road. Tough place. It's almost full shade, um, gets snow dumped on. Um, but the, the plants that showed up on their own in this area, the white wood aster, um, some, some big ferns, mountain laurel, blooming mountain laurel actually grows there quite happily. Um, so this is a, you know, that's an area, just maybe weed it maybe once a year just to take the tree saplings out. Um, but those are low, that's a low maintenance garden, um, using those plants that want to grow there. Um, another one of my favorite natives, wild geranium. Um, and this grows on the roadsides around um, our neighborhood in, in central Mass. Really pretty wild geranium, nice cottage garden sort of plant. Um, grows really nice in borders. Also has really nice fall foliage. Um, so a, a nice plant. A nice, um, nice wild plant that is pretty tolerant of, of tough conditions. So moving on to, um, <coughs> excuse me, other 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 good plants. 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pretty quickly through a lot of native plants, um, as I said, mostly perennials, um, some shrubs. I can't, I can't do small trees and trees because I don't have enough time. Um, but these are all plants that I would consider to be very garden worthy. So um, import good native plants for including in a landscaping, in a garden situation, in a home garden situation. So the wild roses, um, the native roses, these are not the, the hybrid tea roses, um, which come from all over the place. Um, these are the native roses that grow, grow here in New England. Uh, the Virginia rose on the left, that's kind of a thicket forming rose, gets about this high. Um, Carolina rose, which is very similar, which is um, kind of more of a clumper, um, so a, a better behaved um, uh, native rose. Um, it, uh, this picture here, it looks a lot like uh, Rosa rugosa. People often think that Rosa rugosa is a native, but it's not. It's actually um, hails from Asia. So that Rosa rugosa that you see all over the Cape, definitely not the native. Um, there's also a swamp rose, which looks very similar, and that's um, adapted to, to wetter areas, um, moist soils. There's even a climbing rose. Um, that's more of a, uh, a native to the sort of the prairie regions of this country, um, but that's a climbing rose that will gr happily grow here. Um, and just, just a, a note, I mean, nat nativity, there are plants that are native to New England that are not native to the south. There are also plants that are native to the south that grow here, that can be planted here, but are not native. They're not traditionally native here in, in New England. Um, so I, I tend to work with plants that are native to the east coast um, and, and sort of the eastern prairie states too. Um, my personal um, opinion on that is that especially some of the plants from the south with climate change, um, some of the plants that grow in the south um, that don't grow here now may eventually migrate up here anyway um, along with their, along with their co-adapted insect species. So um, I, tend to, I tend to make use of plants that are native to the east coast down, down um, towards the south as well as um, some of the prairie states. Um, but I, I'm not a purist. Um, there are some people that really only want to plant um, plants native to, to Massachusetts, and that's fine. Um, but um, using, using natives from other parts of the country, they're still native, but not necessarily native to this area. A um, couple, couple highlights of some shrubs that are, that, um, are, are worthy of, of including in your landscape. Some of the shrubby dogwoods, they don't get very big. Um, they don't, they're not too big in size. Gray dogwood, the red twig dogwood, red osier dogwood. Um, these are nice shrubs. They have white flowers in June, so they're pollinator, pollinator plants. Um, they also are host plants. Dogwoods are host plants to a number of different Lepidoptera species. A lot of different caterpillars use them as host plants. Um, one example of that is the polyphemus moth, which is a pretty big moth, night flying moth. Um, and that's the caterpillar that we found of the polyphemus moth. But that's one of their host plants there. That's bird food right there. Good, good juicy meal for some baby birds. Um, native viburnums also, there are quite a few uh, viburnums. Uh, most of the viburnums you find in landscapes here are Korean spice. Uh, there are a couple of non-native um, viburnums that are used um, in this area. Korean spice, obviously not a native. But we do have native viburnums as well that um, are very garden worthy. Um, viburnums also having really um, just loaded with fruits that are um, good bird food later in the season. Also well known for their um, nice foliage, very nice um, fall foliage. These are a couple of native viburnums. Um, the hobblebush viburnum, this is a, a woodland viburnum um, blooming right now in Worcester County where I live. Um, astonishing to, to walk through the woods and see this beautiful, it looks like a hydrangea flower, lace cap flowers um, blooming in the woods. Um, and that also has as important fruits later in the year. Host plant for a number of different um, species, including the Harris's checker spot, uh, sorry, the Harris's three spot uh, butterfly, um, which is a master of disguise. I find this, this, this particular caterpillar, I think is really interesting. Well, the moth itself looks like a, looks like a, a lichen, so very well camouflaged. But I have to, I just have to mention the caterpillar of this particular, um, of this particular butterfly. Um, the caterpillar is kind of a master of disguise. Its first stage, it looks like bird poop. So, you know, unlikely that a bird is going to want to eat it. Um, and then it, mor it morphs into another phase where it actually, it, it, it moves on, it, it, um, it, it uh, retains its heads from its previous molting. So it goes through several molts and it will keep its heads from previous moltings. And if it's threatened, it will wave its little heads at, at, at whatever the threat is. So a really interesting, <laughs> 
a really interesting caterpillar. Um, but you know, you can see, you can tell that these, you know, caterpillars have evolved really good ways of not being eaten by birds. Um, caterpillars don't really tend to um, survive it, at high numbers anyway, so they have to they have to adapt using those camouflage methods and other methods. Red and black chokeberry, um, aronia, um, sometimes called photinia. Um, this is a nice shrub. This is a kind of a nice. Um, it's, it's, it's not very tall. It's related to apples. Um, it has apple-like blossoms. Right around now, it's blooming, just about to open in Worcester County. Um, fruits that often persist into winter, so that's bird food in the wintertime, um, but also a host plant for a number of species, including the lace border moth um, and other species. Um, members of the Ericaceae family of plants, and these are these are the heath. This is the these are the heath family of plants. So that would include rhododendrons, mountain laurels, huckleberries. Um, rhododendron. This picture here shows uh, the the pink flower. That's a rhododendron. Now that's probably got some. I, I, that's uh, um, I believe it's a hybrid, so it's got some native rhododendron in it. Um, but the true native rhododendron to Massachusetts is the maximum, which is the white flowering rhododendron. Those are the rhododendrons that used to grow wild in the in the woods of the Berkshires. Um, but the mountain laurels also one of our most beautiful spring blooming. Um, native plants, um, other members of the Ericaceae family, the blueberries, so this is the lowbush blueberry that grows in shady areas, thin soils, etc. cetera. Um, the the, um, the highbush blueberry, that's the, that's the really delicious blueberry from, that you see all over the place in Maine. Um, these, are, um, these are really important to a lot of different species of caterpillar. It's a host plant for underwings, for the spring azure butterfly. Um, and there's also um, a number of pollen, a number of native bees that collect pollen only from vaccinium, only from blueberry flowers. Um, native New England hollies. Um, so the hollies that you tend to see in yards um, most of the time, you see Chinese, uh, China, China boy, China girl, et cetera, clearly not native. Um, but the American holly, the evergreen American holly that you see growing usually in sandy or well-drained areas, you see it on the Cape. That's the true, um, that's the true um, American holly. There's inkberry holly, which is also a, an evergreen. Um, looks a lot like boxwood, often used in, in as a replacement for boxwood. It's got very similar foliage. Um, inkberry holly, winterberry holly. That's a deciduous native holly. That's just that this, this um, winterberry holly is a great plant for winter interest. Um, it retains its its bear, those bright red berries um, long after the the snow flies. So really ornamental um, native holly for um, for winter interest. Holly's also host plant for a lot of different Lepidoptera, the Ruby Quakers, the Holly Sallow, um, and also the flowers. Those tiny flowers are actually bumble pollinated, um, those tiny little flowers. Holly's are dioecious, so they need a male and female in, in order to, um, to produce berries, one thing to think about. Um, moving on to some perennials, um, garden-worthy perennials, so uh, starting with the Asteracea family of plants. Um, including Joe Pieweed. Um, this is a native plant. It's got these big cauliflower-like pink blooms in, in summertime. Um, absolute magnet for all kinds of butterflies and pollinators. Um, also a host plant for a lot of different species. The bees love the flowers. Um, it's, there's, there's certain heights. There's some that are short, some that are tall, um, but a good plant for, for summer nectar and pollen especially. Um, cousins to Joe Pieweed um, include the bone set, um, the, the bone set, which is kind of a shady, sort of moist soil shade kind of plant, adapted plant. Um, the sand adapted um, Eupatorium is called Hisop leaf thoroughwort, that has white flowers similar to bone set, similar to Joe Pieweed. Um, but this is definitely a, this is a plant that likes it dry and, and well drained. Um, really good plants for, for pollinators and birds too. Um, Monarda, so that's the bee bombs. Um, Monarda, great plant for gardens, such, such ornamental blooms as the red bee balm. Um, that's probably one of, I would put that in the top three of hummingbird plants in, in my own particular garden. Um, they fight, they, the hummingbirds, when the bee balm is in bloom, the red bee balm, um, the hummingbirds literally have aerial dog fights over the bee balm, fighting over those flowers, those tubular red flowers. There's a pink uh, bee balm too, um, looks very similar, blooms a little bit earlier. Um, and that's a little bit more adapted to slightly more, sh more um, drier soils um, than the red bee balm. Doesn't spread as aggressively as the red either. 
Um, but bee balm, all the monarders are great plants, are, are great flowers for the hummingbirds, um, for the hummingbird clearwing moths, long-tongued bees. Some um, bees have long tongues that um, they use to, 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 um, to collect nectar from those, from those long petals, from those long um, tubular flowers. Um, and there is a later blooming bee balm, a horse mint, it's called horse mint, Monarda punctata. And that's a cool flower. We just put some of those in at Breakneck Hill a couple uh, last year, I think. Um, and they're, they bloom, bloom later and they will tolerate a lot more dry, well, uh, they, they like it well drained is what they like. Um, so they'll grow on a slope or in sandy soils, et cetera. Um, but all the monarders, really important wildlife plants. Um, also, there, there actually are some pollen, some, some specialist bees that collect pollen only from Monarda, too. Um, Leatris and Rebecca, um, these are, I, I include them together because I always really like the combination of them. Um, they bloom around the same time. Um, Leatris spicata, so the spiky, um, the spiky Leatris that you see there growing with, um, with Rebecca. Um, so there's purple varieties. There's also a white variety of that, um, of the spicata. Um, then there are the button Leatrises, um, the native, we have a native Leatris, um, New England Blazing Star, and again, really, really popular with pollinators. These plants have these, those, these um, racemes, these spikes of flowers, are made up of lots and lots of tiny little flowers, and each of those little flowers is a nectar, is a nectary, is a, is a source of food for, for tiny pollinators, or pollinators of all size, they'll use Leatris. Um, and the seeds also, the, the goldfinches especially, they really love the seeds later in the year. Um, I, I, love, I just love the combination of, of Rudbeckia and Leatris, really, really striking and blooms for a long time in, in summertime. Um, perennial sunflower, um, now these are, the, these are not the annual sunflowers that you see with the really huge flowers, these have smaller flowers. Um, there's a number of different native species to this area, there's a wood the wood sunflower, which is Helianthus divaricatus. Um, there is th this one here, which is my personal favorite, um, Helianthus decapetulus. Um, it's thin-leafed sunflower. Um, but they, they, if you've ever seen sun, um, birds um, eating sunflower seeds from the annual, they do the same thing. They love these, these flowers here. Um, also pollinators, a really great plant for pollinators. Those petals give butterflies and insects a place to land to, to, um, to enjoy the nectar. Um, there's also Jerusalem artichoke, which is Helianthus tuberosa. That's an edible. Those, um, it produces little underground, um, they're like little potatoes that, that, are, um, that you can eat. Um, but that is a plant that I would not recommend unless you give it its own space to spread because Jerusalem artichoke will spread and take over an area. Um, most of these perennial sunflowers are pretty tall. So, you know, they're kind of the elephant in the room if you have them in a small garden. But if you have an area where, you know, by a fence, et cetera, where you can let them um, really do their thing. They're pretty spectacular um, in the summertime. Late in the summer, the goldenrod. Um, quintessential fall, late summer, um, native plant. Um, there are many species of goldenrod, um, but I can't understate the importance of goldenrod as a, as a wildlife plant for pollinators, for beneficial insects, for birds, the seeds that they produce later on. Um, there's so many, so many insects that use goldenrod. Um, you can see the photo here. You can see how there's the, there's just thousands of little tiny flowers on each um, on each plant, and those it's really um, <coughs> a good food source for a lot of a lot of different species. Now, um, goldenrod is one of those plants that people tend to consider weedy, and there certainly are um, there certainly are weedy types of goldenrod that do not play well with other plants that you don't want in your in your ornamental gardens. Um, there's canadensis. Um, I'll, I'll show it in the next slide. Goldenrod also a host plant for a lot of different species, including this, um, this asteroid caterpillar. You can see how well camouflaged he is. Um, also for grays, um, a, a type of little butterfly. Um, but yeah, there are, there, it's like milkweed. There are, there are weedy milkweeds that you don't want, like the common milkweed, which has underground rhizomes that pops up all over the place. Not really good for a small garden, but there are also well-behaved milkweeds. Um, same with goldenrod. Um, there are well-behaved go uh, goldenrods that don't spread. Um, the canadensis is the one that you tend to see in old fields. At Breakneck Hill, you'll see it everywhere. You know, we're trying to keep it out of the pollinator gardens because it will just take over. But um, again, it's a really important plant. Um, but uh, there are, there are well-behaved goldenrods for gardens. Um, uh, Solidago speciosa, that's the, the plant in the, 
previous picture on the left. Really beautiful. In fact, it's kind of interesting because goldenrods in Europe, they've brought goldenrods over to Europe and they love goldenrods as an ornamental. They, 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 it's all over the place in Europe and it's not native there. Um, we tend to kind of you know, consider it a weed, so we don't appreciate it, but it really is a great plant. There's even a white goldenrod, which kind of grows in edges of woods, etc. cetera. Um, there's the yellow flat tops goldenrod too. Um, lots of different goldenrod species. Um, asters, again, almost as, as important as goldenrod for, for that late season um, wildlife um, resource. So there are lots of different types of asters. There's an aster for just about every type of soil, every type of growing conditions that you have in your yard. There are the, the New York and the uh, New England asters, the blue and the purples. Um, there's the white wood aster, um, which is the woodland aster. There's also a um, there's a, a heart-leafed blue aster um, and some spectacular um, asters that we have native to this area. So um, certainly t they, they'll probably show up in their own and they, uh, they, you know, they, have, they have their certain, certain requirements for where they like to live, but they will show up even under, like the wood aster will show up under hemlock trees. They'll grow under hemlocks. Asters, so the flowers being very important, nectar and pollen sources. Um, as well as um, asters being a host plant for a lot of little butterflies. Little pearl crescent butterfly, they use asters as a host plant. Um, this caterpillar on the right here is a brown-headed owlet caterpillar, really tiny. I mean, these caterpillars, this, this one on the right, I had to zoom it in on my computer to really even get a good look at it. Um, you would hardly even see these caterpillars, but they're there. Um, I like that caterpillar because it looks kind of like a, sal it, it's got a, like a Salvador Dali sort of um, coloring about it, very striking. Um, so I'll finish by going through just some different plants for different types of conditions that you have on your property, um, sun, shade, soil, slopes, etc. So if you have full, su full sun and an area that's either a slope, well-drained, even sandy soils or somewhere at the top of a, uh, like at the top of a wall, that's really well-drained. A couple of plants that will do really well for you, the moss phlox, um, that's blooming right now. Um, blooming its head off over at the, at the top of a retaining wall. Um, milkweed, the orange butterfly milkweed. Um, I mentioned there are there's some really ornamental milkweeds that are not aggressive. Um, this is one of them, and this is a, this is a sand adapted plant. Um, it's beautiful when it blooms. It blooms sort of late June, et cetera, um, but it grows in sandy areas. It grows in um, well-drained soils, um, doesn't like wet feet. Um, you used to see a lot more of it. It's, the, it's, it's, it's a victim of the fact that it really likes to grow in open, sandy fields, which is where people really like to build houses, too. So you don't often see it in the wild anymore, but if you have sandy soil, I have one client that lives on like a sand dune in Sudbury, and this plant just appears on its own there. So <coughs> good plants for, for well-drained soil. Agastache is another one. Um, one of the best pollinator nectar plants, um, Agastache, um, hyssop, uh, 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 lavender hyssop. Um, that's, that's, uh, it's, it's uh, got these flower spikes, blooms for a really long time, um, very popular with all types, of, all types of pollinators. I see hummingbirds even visiting them. Um, a great seed plant too, the birds love them later in the year um, when, they, when they go to seed. A good plant for well-drained soil, and they'll they'll bloom the first year from seed, so they're pretty easy to. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a pollinator. Come to, come to. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's. I can't tell what it was. It looked like a wasp, but but there are a lot of pollinators that try to look like wasps. They it, it had yellow and black stripes, so it could or it could not be. It could be a fly. That's pretty. That's pretty interesting. He he came to to visit the flowers, I guess. <laughs> um, so if, you have, if you do have that really dry or well-drained soil, a couple of other plants, a low shrub called New Jersey tea. Um, and this blooms in late June, usually. Um, and it is literally, it is a pollinator magnet. You would not believe, when this blooms, when this plant blooms, you wouldn't believe the, the activity going on around those flowers. It is just, there are all shapes and sizes of pollinators all, all visiting those flowers. Um, there's also a, a, a small mining bee, a type of na native bee. They only collect pollen from, from New Jersey tea. It's also a host plant for a lot of different species, the spring azure, unicorn caterpillar. They use New Jersey tea as a, as a host plant. But a, a nice low shrub for, um, for dry soils. Um, an evergreen ground cover for dry or well-drained soils, bearberry, um, Arctostaphylos uva ursi. 
Um, that's, it's an evergreen, it's pretty low. Um, it's got flowers that look a lot like blueberries, if they are related, they're all in the heath family. Um, that's a nice plant if you've got a, like a little edge of between a driveway, you know, as long as it's well drained, it will cover that area. Um, nice, nice evergreen ground cover. Um, pearly everlasting, I had to throw this one in because we, we, we tried putting in a couple at Breakneck Hill a couple of years ago. I don't think they came, they made it through the first winter. Um, but a nice little, um, it's diminutive, you know, it's, it's a low plant. It likes sort of gravelly um, soils, well-drained soils, but it's got these really pretty little flowers that are like, they look like little paper, um, little paper flowers. Host plant for American lady butterflies is pearly everlasting. Juniper and eastern red cedar, um, these are plants that are, they have a lot of wildlife value. The scratchy foliage makes it very good for birds to um, take cover in. Um, in that scratchy foliage, um, the, it produces fruits. The females produce fruits that are bird food, um, but a host plant, an important host plant um, for a lot of different species, including um, the juniper carpet, which are little tiny caterpillars, the Jupiter geometer, mostly um, they use eastern red cedar, the juniper hair streak, you can see it's uh, pretty well camouflaged. Um, little butterfly, good plants. Shrubby sankofoil, uh, um, this is taken, I took this, um, this is the yellow flowering plant shrub there. It doesn't get very high, it gets about this high, so it's a nice low shrub for a sunny area, well-drained soil. Um, this is on, taken on the Rose Kennedy Greenway, so um, that's, that's where that is um, growing there. Um, interesting, I just threw this picture in because it's a host plant for a couple of different Lepidoptera, including the lace, lace border moth caterpillar, which is, looks just like a twig. Um, talk about a good camouflage. You know, this, this caterpillar, a bird is not likely to, to recognize that as a food source. Um, Northern bu bush honeysuckle, um, so it's not actually a honeysuckle, but it's, it's Deer Villa lanicera. Um, uh, that's a, it's a nice low native shrub. It's got little yellow flowers. The bumblebees seem to really like the, the, the yellow flowers. A nice landscaping shrub. Not really the most showy in the world, but it's got nice fall foliage, and it will grow in parking lot islands, on the edges of, ro um, on the edges of driveways. It's a, a tough little shrub to fill a space. Also a host plant for the snowberry clearwing moth caterpillar, which is this little spotted guy here. Um, other plants for sandy soils, natives, um, the wild blue lupine, um, that's the true native um, um, as, as opposed to the, the, the lupins that you see when you go up to Maine all over the roadsides, those are not the native. Um, but the wild blue lupine has a distinction of being the only host plant for a little butterfly called the Carner Blue and they will only use the true native. They won't use the, um, they won't use the, the, the Russell lupins which are the ones that you see tend to see in landscapes and along roadsides. Um, there's also a flowering spurge, a type of euphorbia that's also sand adapted. Looks like a, sort of like the flowers look like a, like a native baby's breath kind of plant. Um, other sand adapted perennials, this is, I took this, or actually this is Curtis Adams' picture, but this was taken at um, Mont Auburn Cemetery where it's very sandy soils there and they have, um, they have this nice grouping of, of perennials here, uh, the Leatris, this, um, New England Blazing Star, which is adapted to sand. Um, Rebecca, um, the white flower is the, this is the hyssop leaf thoroughwort, the eupatorium that is adapted to sandy soils. Um, and then it looks like we have uh, probably seaside goldenrod or goldenrod speciosa um, there, along with grasses. But um, just some, uh, you know, plants for, for the right plant for the right place. Um, Meadows, so New England meadow, meadow, meadow made of New England native plants or prairie plants, et cetera, um, is, is if you do have a spot to create a little sunny meadow um, for some of these plants, the cone flowers, the purple cone flowers, the leatris, et cetera, um, they all are, they, that's, that's their habitat. Um, grasses, of course, being an integral part of, of every meadow um, landscape. Um, there's a book there that's the High Line, um, but these pictures, if you ever want good inspiration for, um, for using native plants, especially grasses in your landscape, the High Line has a lot of great areas with lots of, um, of grasses that are truly inspirational. Um, grasses being pretty tough. They can grow up on an elevated highway line and, or railway line in New York City. Um, they should be able to grow in, in your average 
um, garden in, in Massachusetts. Um, there are also host plants. Grasses, um, host plants for a, a, a number of small butterflies, the little wood nymph, the little wood satyr, Indian skippers, they all use grasses as host plants. So they do have importance as, as um, for, for those pollinators or for, those, for the insects. Um, now flowering lawns, so if you, um, a, a, an easy way to incorporate natives into your, into your landscape is to let your lawn, you know, give up the chemicals, let, let some of those natives come into your lawn and, and, and create a flowering lawn. So that would include violets, um, bluets, Quaker ladies, um, the, the bluets, um, this is a picture of our riding ring on our farm. So it gets a lot of hoof traffic, so that's a tough little plant, it, you know, it, it comes back every year. Um, these are all plants that will probably show up on their own. Bluets are a host plant for um, spring azure butterflies. This is a picture of the, the flowers of the bluets close up. Um, and you can see how these are perfectly adapted for small pollinators. They've even got a little marking here to show the pollinators exactly where they need to land. So very, very um, adapted plant there. Host plant for spring azures, butterflies. Um, and flowering lawns, again, the birds, you will, you'll see a lot of increase in bird activity too if you do allow those, those, those plants to come into your lawn. Um, there will be a lot more for, them, for those birds to eat. Um, all those insects that are, are visiting the flowers, that's also bird food too. This is a northern flicker. Um, you often see them picking away at natural lawns. They eat ants and other bugs. Carex sedges is a, um, a, actually a grass-like plant. It's not a grass, but it looks like one. Um, you'll see those, they will pop up if you um, have, especially if you have some moist soils, but um, they'll, they'll show up in woodlands. There's lots of different types for, of sedges. I love them. They just look like little fountains when they, um, when they form their, their shape. Um, host plant for a little black dash cut caterpillars and lots, dozens of small caterpillar species will use sedges as a, as a host plant. Um, this is Pennsylvania sedge, just a couple of applications of it where it's actually used sort of as a, as a, as a lawn substitute here. This is at Garden in the Woods. Um, the picture on the left is at um, UMass where they've been experimenting with native plants for landscaping use. If you have sun, full sun and moisture, moist soils, you have a huge palette of really beautiful native plants to choose from. Um, uh, the picture on the left is late summer. There's a goldenrod and the, pr the, the, the pink flowering plants. That's called ironweed. Um, we have some of those up at Breakneck Hill. Um, a true pollinator magnet. And when the ironweed is blooming and the monarch butterflies are in town, that's the only flowers that they even care about. They love the ironweed flowers. It's a really good ne nectar source for butterflies. Um, the hibiscus, the swamp mallow hibiscus, um, hard to believe that something with these these tropical looking blooms are actually native to this part of the world, but they are. They grow kind of on coastal ponds um, near the coast, but a beautiful late summer um, hummingbird plant, especially the hummingbirds love the, the hibiscus. Um, they, they like sort of, well, we have them growing on the top of Breakneck Hill and they've done really well without, and that's not what I would call wet soil. You know, so they're, they're called swamp hibiscus, but they do seem to adapt pretty well to, to, to decent, um, to decent uh, garden soil. The garden phlox, um, beautiful plant, you see it, I mean, most people don't even realize that it is an American native plant, the, the garden phlox. It's growing here in Hildeen, which is a, a, the Hildeen estate in formal gardens. Um, you can find it usually at most nurseries too. Really beautiful plant, great foliage, uh, great uh, fragrance, hugely fragrant. I don't know why I have two pictures of the same thing in here, but. Um, late summer, all kinds of pollinating insects, especially the long-tongued, um, the hummingbirds, the, the clearing moths, etc. They, they really love the flowers um, of the phlox. Moist sun, some more plants, blue lobelia, great blue lobelia on the left. Um, great hummingbird plant also. Sneezeweed with yellow flowers. Um, that's a, that likes moisture, but it will gr actually grow in, in a little bit, you know, just de uh, regular garden soil too. These are all full sun lovers. The native lilies, um, like the Turk's cap lilies, um, the wood lily, Canada lily, all beautiful lilies, um, all native. Um, hummingbird especially do, do like the, the, the native lilies. Um, the, here's the bee balm again, the hummingbird favorite. Um, the white flower behind the bee balm, that's actually called daisy fleabane, and that is an annual, that's a native annual. It looks a lot like aster, um, but blooms a little bit earlier. Uh, swamp milkweed, um, that's a, that's a um, native milkweed. 
called swamp milkweed, but it, so it grows in sort of edges of, of ponds, et cetera, but that will grow pretty well in, um, in, in regular garden soil too. Mountain mint, another pollinator plant extraordinaire, Pycnanthemum is the genus. Um, and that's a nice plant for just kind of filling in and mingling around other plants. It's got those white flowers, it blooms for a long time, and really it's one of the best pollinator plants. There are a lot of, a lot of pollinator diversity that you'll find on visiting those flowers there. Wild senna, I threw this one in. Um, this is kind of an unusual plant. It looks, looks kind of exotic, but it is a native. I've never seen it in the wild, but um, it, it likes kind of well-drained um, well soils. It gets, the flowers can get to about this high if it's in a really happy place. This is, I took this at Breakneck Hill. These are the pollinator gardens at Breakneck Hill, so we have it growing there. Um, I like the combination of the, the white veronicastrum, which is Culver's root. That's a native, um, a native wild flower. Um, nice combination with the wild senna. A really good bumblebee plant. Bumblebees seem to really favor the flowers. It's a legume, so it's in the bean family. Um, as a legume, it's actually the host plant for a lot of different butterflies, including the little sulfur, cloudless sulfur um, butterflies. Ground covers for sun, moist sun. There's actually very few flowering ground covers um, that for, for moist sun. Um, mostly because moist sun is a very highly competitive place and, and most plants get taller and will, will outshade the barren strawberry. But barren strawberry, nice little ground cover for moist sunshine. Um, some shrubs for, for moist sun, coastal sweet pepper bush or summer sweet, very, very fragrant um, uh, flowers in the midsummer. Um, really attractive to pollinators. Um, the, white, the, the species has white flowers, as you can see on the left. There is a cultivar with pink flowers called uh, Ruby Spice, I believe, is the name of the cultivar. Um, great, great plant for, especially for the fragrance. Nine bark, that's the, the big shrub with the dark foliage and the white flowers there. Um, that's a good pollen, uh, good nectar plant. Birds, I've found that birds seem to really like to nest in that shrub too. But a nice plant, give it some room though. It will get uh, pretty big and wide. Needs, needs some room to, to do its thing. Host plant for a lot of different Lepidoptera species, little caterpillars. Spirea, um, mostly the spireas that you see in gardens are usually the Japanese or Asian spireas with the pink flowers. Um, but there are native spireas. So this is meadow sweet here. It's kind of hard to see the picture here. This is at in Spencer. Um, but they grow in areas where there's some soil moisture, but also very dry soils too, pretty adaptable. Um, good, good plant for pollinators especially. Um, and then there's Virginia sweet spire, which is a little shrub. Um, I call it almost native because it's native, I think it's native to probably New Jersey south, but it does grow really well here in New England. Um, the dwarf variety is called Little Henry, um, and that doesn't get very tall. The, the species gets a little bit taller, but that's a nice shrub. It doesn't get too wide. Um, it has really beautiful fall foliage um, as well as flowers that are um, slight fragrance um, in June. So a pretty native shrub that will fit into a small space. If you have wet soils or poorly draining soils or have bogs, et cetera, on your, so on, on your property, there's so many, there's so many natives that, that will thrive in those conditions. The marsh marigold, um, the top left with those bright yellow flowers, it's already bloomed, early bloomer. Um, the, the, the pond lily, if you, have a, if you have pond, water, a pond on your property. Um, and cardinal flower. Um, cardinal flower I have to highlight because it is another one of the really favorite hummingbird plants. Those tubular flowers, the hummingbirds love that, those bright scarlet flowers. Um, and that will grow, you, that will grow in shade. Um, I've seen it growing on like the edge of a stream in the woods, um, but it will grow in soils that have sort of consistent moisture as well. Um, but if you, if you want to bring in the hummingbirds, um, cardinal flower is a, is a good choice. Um, wet soils, button bush. This is a, 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 a native shrub that if you, if you do have decent soil, um, this will grow. It doesn't require wet soil. It grows on the edges of ponds, but it doesn't require wet soil. Um, but it's a, it's a great shrub because the flowers are just amazing. The flowers are like these, 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 um, these orbs, these white orbs. Um, but the, the bees really love the flowers. The flowers are fragrant. Um, which attracts a lot of different um, pollinators. And it's a host plant for a lot of different species, including the saddleback, the aptly named saddleback caterpillar, Promethean moth, they also use it, the hornworm sphinx moth, the Harris's three spot, and the beautiful wood nymph. Those are all caterpillars that use button bush. Um, understory shrubs, so these are shrubs that grow under the, the canopy of other trees um, or not. 
the service berry in Malonkier. Really, I had, to, I had to throw this in because every, every backyard, every garden deserves at least one amelonchi or one service berry. Blooms really early, usually in April, um, this year a little bit later, um, but a great wildlife shrub, a great native shrub. Um, blooms early, ne early season nectar source. Um, it's also, one of its common names is June berry because the berries ripen in June and when those berries ripen, actually even before they ripen, the birds, the cedar waxwings especially, will come in and just strip the berries off of this off this tree. A really beautiful early blooming native tree, and as a native tree, it's a it's a host plant for a lot of different a um, lot of different uh, butterfly caterpillars. Um, American hydrangea. Most most of the hydrangeas. So the the most of the hydrangeas you see in gardens here are not native. Um, there are a couple of natives um, to this area. American hydrangea or smooth hydrangea. Um, and that is usually sold in garden centers as Annabelle, which has these big white, um, these huge white blooms. Um, but the, the native, the actual straight species um, are, not, are not quite as showy, the flowers. Um, but the, the, Annabelle, the Annabelle hydrangea actually is a, good, is a good indication of sometimes cultivars, um, selections of native plants, cultivars, Often they don't have the wildlife value that the straight species does. Um, in this case, the Annabelle hydrangea, the, the flowers are completely sterile, so they don't produce any pollen or nectar, and they don't set seed. So really, they're not a great choice for um, for the wildlife value. The straight species, the flowers are, you know, the flowers are fertile, so you'll see a lot more pollinators uh, on those on those plants on those flowers. Hydrangea sphinx moth is a co-adapted um, sphinx moth that uses hydrangea as a host plant. Um, and then to finish with um, shade plants, um, native shade plants. And this is what really gets fun. If you have trees on your property, you have little areas with, um, with shade and trees, a little bit of woods, etc. There are so many great shade ground covers um, or, or shade plants that will grow. A lot of them are those early spring bloomers where they bloom before the trees leaf out. But my personal favorite, and I have it all over the place, wherever I can plant it, is um, foam flower. Um, Tiarella cordifolia, just a really, it's blooming right now, it's just covered in these, these frothy blooms, um, so the bumblebees visit those, um, just one of my favorite, the, the foliage is almost evergreen, um, just a, a really great plant um, for shade gardens and under trees. Um, another, another really good ground cover for shady areas is bloodroot, I love this plant too, it blooms, it was blooming about a week ago where I am, um, but it has these pure white blooms. Um, that they, it, the flowers appear before the leaves do. Um, it's, it's, it's a plant that in every form it's, it's beautiful. Um, the flowers will close up on a cloudy day, um, so they look like little tiny tulips. Sanguinary canadensis is the, is the botanical name. Um, and then the foliage, when the foliage emerges um, a little bit later on, it's a really, really lush um, shade ground cover that grows pretty happily under, under trees, um, um, this is actually on a slope, so it, it likes the, the good drainage of this slope here. Um, this, I took this picture last week because I have never seen, this has been a spectacular year for bloodroot, and I have never seen my bloodroot blooming so profusely as, as this picture shows. Um, a really good year for bloodroot, but a very, very nice, um, a a nice, nice shade plant. More ground covers for shade um, include green and gold, which is the yellow flowering plant there, Chrysogonum virginiana. That blooms kind of off and on right through the summer. Um, Allegheny Pachysandra, there is a native Pachysandra. The Pachysandra that most people have in yards is, is definitely not native, um, but there is a native Pachysandra. It's not quite evergreen, so that's how you can usually tell it apart. It looks very similar, um, but there is, there is a native Pachysandra. Wild ginger, wild ginger is the, the plant with the, the heart-shaped leaves here. That's a great um, shade plant for sort of filling in and really covering the ground in, in, um, under trees and in shade gardens. Um, and when, 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 when you're gardening in shade, um, it's, it's not always the best idea to try to have a single mat of one plant. Um, it's a lot easier if you can kind of create what, what I call the tapestry effect, where you have lots of, different, um, lots of different plants that will all sort of join together and form a, you know, a, form a single um, ground cover. Um, so there's so many of the, the native plants that would fill that role. Um, on the left is the yellow wood poppy. The, the blue flowers are wild blue phlox. 
I see Stalaman seal here. Uh, red, the red flowers here are red columbine. That's the native columbine. That's a great hummingbird plant. Hummingbirds um, really love red columbine, those red tubular flowers. You can see how it would be perfect hummingbird plants. And the, the, the nectar is found at the base of that tube there. So um, you can see how that is, a, is pollinated by, by hummingbirds for sure. Um, I threw this picture in not because of the cat, but because um, just to indicate that columbine, it's, it's thought of as a, as a woodland plant, a shade plant, but it actually will just grow anywhere where there's good, where there's springtime sun and good drainage. And I have it as actually growing in the sandy, the sandy um, base of, of our brick patio here. You know, it's growing and blooming right there. So its main requirement is good drainage. Um, here's a just, this is a picture of a of garden in the woods in Framingham, um, just illustrating what I mean by that tapestry effect of you know, all these plants that are really sort of woven together um, and they, the, you know, they do their thing early in the year. Um, another, another, some other plants you might not be familiar with. This is called um, Mitella diphylla. It's miterwort or bishop's cap. Um, and I'm, a, I'm completely obsessed with this plant. It's very small, it's diminutive. Um, it's not a tall plant, um, but the flowers, if you get down at ground level and really look at the flowers, they look like perfectly shaped uh, snowflakes. I just, I just think that they are, they're, they're so beautiful. Um, it's, it's, uh, the botanic name is Mitella diphylla, yeah. and it's, uh, or two-leaved bishop's cap. Yeah. Yep. Now, these are all perennials. Yep, correct. These are all shade perennials. Golden groundsel, Pecker aurea, um, that's another one with those yellow flowers. Um, gives, some, gives some pop, that yellow gives some pop to, to those shade plantings. Um, jewelweed. Now, jewelweed. If you, if you, jewelweed is a good indicator plant. If you, if you have a lot of jewelweed growing, you know that you probably have some damp areas and fairly shady. Um, jewelweed is one of those plants that will show up on its own. It's actually an annual. It seeds itself cra like crazy and comes up every year, um, but it's easy to yank in places that you don't want it. But I, I highlight jewelweed because it's, it's a native impatience, um, and it is a hummingbird plant. The hummingbirds, it, its blooms. It blooms right at the time when hummingbirds are really fattening up for their flight south. Um, so it's an important hummingbird plant, important bumblebee plant. Um, it's got these little orange flowers. There are some varieties that are yellow. Um, another name for them are, is touch me not because it's, if, if, um, if, you, if, if you squeeze the seed pods just at the right time, they explode. It's a really, it's a really cool plant for kids too. It's got these exploding seed pods. Um, more, more tapestry plants, um, some of the bulbs, spring blooming bulbs that are native, trout lily with these little lily flowers, uh, Virginia bluebells on the right looks really pretty in, in mixed in with other, other wildflowers, that tapestry effect again. Um, trillium, trillium is, is um, just a special, special native plant here. There's several different types of trillium that grow, they grow in the wild still around where I live. Um, they're pretty expensive to buy. I just bought some for a client last week at Garden in the Woods, and I think it was $24 for a little pot of one, one flowering trillium. Um, but a, a beautiful spring ephemeral plant. Um, and if you have shade, then ferns. Ferns are the ar archetypal plants for, for, for the woodlands. Um, lots of different ferns. There's a fern for just about any kind of, any kind of situation that you have. Um, I love the cinnamon ferns. We have some, some big cinnamon ferns on our property. Cinnamon ferns. Um, have these brown fronds. They're easily identifiable. Before the leaves really unfurl, the fronds appear. Um, and hummingbirds will use the brown, uh, they, they will use that as a nesting material. They'll pick at those fronds to use in their nests. Um, but there's ferns for just about any kind of condition that you have in your yard. And they will usually show up on their own um, if you let them. Again, that's selective weeding. Um, and ferns are even, they are even host plants. There are fern moths. There are different fern moth caterpillars. Um, so they, they do have their, their, um, their uses for, for, um, for wildlife. Um, if you have a woodland edge, so that area where the lawn meets the woods, um, there are a lot of plants that will grow really well in that, that edge situation there. Um, native plants, so we have the white wood aster on the left. Um, the bottom left is co uh, called tall goat's beard, Aruncus dioicus. That's a great pollinator plant too, but that will grow in, in that partial shade environment. Um, and then one of my favorite, another of my native um, favorites is black cohosh. That's a really great plant. Um, it's where it's happy, it will really, it will really um, um, bloom profusely. Um, it's got these spires of, of white flowers. 
Um, perfect plant for a, for a woodland edge, a really, really attractive to pollinators. Those little tiny flowers um, attract a huge diversity of, of pollinators when it blooms in, mid, in midsummer. Um, other types of actia related, um, red baneberry, doll's eyes, et cetera, they all have berries um, um, and, and white flowers. Dry shade, so if you have dry shade, I get this question a lot, what, what will grow in dry shade? Red columbine will grow in dry shade. Solomon seal, uh, wintergreen is a is a plant that grows in in dry shade. Galtheria procumbens it has those red bright red berries that op often persist right into winter. Um, under white pines, definitely a challenge. If you've ever walked into a white pine forest, you'll notice that there's not a lot of plants growing in the understory there. Um, it's a very challenging environment for plants, but there are certainly plants that will grow under white pines, including low bush blueberry, sweet fern, white wood aster. Pennsylvania sedge is often growing under there, wood fern, um, wavy hair grass. There's very few grasses, ornamental grasses that grow in shade, but wavy hair grass is one of them. Deschampsia flexuosa, I have a picture of that here. Um, and wood anemone also is one that I have, I have noted growing underneath white pines. Under hemlocks, again, pretty challenging. Again, the white wood aster, the foam flower will actually grow under, under hemlocks. I don't have pictures here, but starflower, Solomon seal, again, mountain laurel, Christmas fern is an evergreen fern that grows under hemlocks, and that black cohosh, that Actea racemosa, those are all plants that will, will certainly grow under, under, that, under the hemlock understory. Um, just to finish off with a couple of vines, um, a couple of native vines. Um, I talked earlier about coral honeysuckle. The red tubular flowers, um, that's a great vine for climbing over a fence, crawl, crawl, crawling up an arbor or a trellis, et cetera. A real hummingbird magnet, really a, one of the best hummingbird plants. And it will bloom, it will bloom right through the summer oftentimes, right up until first frost. Um, um, uh, wisteria, um, the, the traditional wisteria that, has, that, that grows in landscapes is the Asian wisteria. Um, and that's not a plant that I would recommend for anybody to grow because it will actually eat siding and it will, it's very hard to eradicate um, the American wisteria. So it needs to be, or sorry, the, the Asian wisteria. But there is an American wisteria. There's a couple types of American wisteria. Um, this is a Kentucky, I believe, Kentucky wisteria. So these are southern natives, but they will grow here in New England. Um, and they look very similar to the, for, to the Asian wisteria, but they, they don't have the fragrance of the, of the Asian wisteria. But they do look very similar, and they, they perform a similar role in the landscape. Uh, it's a host plant, actually, for a couple of different types of butterflies, dusky wings. Some skippers will use that, and, and, and blues. Uh, Virginia creeper. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a native vine. Um, there's one, one type of Virginia creeper that is more of a sprawling, more of a ground cover, will grow on walls. Um, or even as a ground cover. Um, and then there's the climbing, the, the climbing Virginia creeper, which climbs trees, will climb a, a, climb a, 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 um, a building, a wall, et cetera. Um, Virginia creeper, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a vine. So in vines, as they're, you know, they're, the very nature of vines is that they like to, they like to grow. Um, but this is not a vine that's going to actually sort of take down trees the way um, Asian bittersweet does the, the, some of the invasive vines. So it's also got spectacular fall, fall foliage. Um, so uh, you know it's a, it's a good vine for covering a chain link fence or you know, somewhere where you need something to, to cover things up. And it's a host plant. It's got its own, um, there's a, the, the Pandora sphinx moth uses Virginia creeper as a host plant. That caterpillar with all the eyes there that you can see in the picture. Love that guy. Um, the eight spotted forester, they also use Virginia creeper as a host plant. Um, there are a couple of native clematis vines. Um, the one that, is, um, that I tend to use the most is, is um, uh, it's called Virgin's Bower or Devil's Darning Needles. It's got these, these nice um, common names. Um, that blooms in late summer, very fragrant blooms. And this, this is a plant that will happily cover a trellis or an arbor, et cetera. Um, it can be used as, as, as any kind of clematis vine. Um, not to be mistaken with the Sweet Autumn clem Clematis, which is off, it blooms around the same time, but is actually kind of being considered invasive now in that it's starting to reseed itself. Um, this is the true native. And it is, you know, it's, it's, it's an aggressive vine, like all vines are. But if you have somewhere that you would like a, a vine, a flowering vine, um, and you can cut it right down to the ground at the end of the year, too. Um, 
to uh, you know to um, to keep it from <coughs> taking over too much. Um, and one last vine is uh, what's called the wild bean or ground nut, Apios americana. And this is a vine that might show up on your property. Um, it's, a it's, a, it's a wild bean. <coughs> it has uh, little pink flowers that are like pea-like flowers. It's a legume. Um, edible, edible seed pods. Um, also edible little the, the beans. They're um, underground beans like peanuts um, attached to the roots of this vine. Um, but that's a nice vine. Um, if you're looking for something to, to, to climb. Um, also a host plant for the silver spotted skipper butterfly. So I'll just finish off by talking about where you can find native plants because that's certainly a challenge. Um, it's, that's, it's getting easier. Um, but in this picture here, that's me looking longingly at a, at a plant sale somewhere. I think that's at Tower Hill. Um, but places to, to shop for, for native plants, New England Wildflower Society in Framingham, they also have a nursery in Waitley, which is in Western Mass. Um, they are, they'll, that's probably the best place to find, especially some of the more unusual of, these, of the natives. Um, Bigelow's in Northboro, not too far down the road. Um, they have a pretty large selection and growing each year of native plants, um, especially, you know, Massachusetts grown native plants. Um, that's a good source. Um, they have their inventory online now, so you can actually kind of shop to see what they have available. Um, there's an organization called Grow Native Massachusetts. Um, they're based in Waltham, I think. Um, and they have a sale this weekend, actually, a, plant, a native plant sale. And they have a lot of variety. They have a lot of uh, plants available. I think it's this Saturday. I know it's this Saturday. I think it's in Waltham, but it might be in Cambridge. It's Oh, okay. There's a link to that. The link to that sale on the on on the Facebook group, the grow the native plant gardens of Southboro. Yeah, GrowNativeMass.org is their website, um, but they have a lot of variety, and they they have I think they have pretty good prices too, from what I've been able to see. Um, I do have a little I have a small native plant nursery out in Spencer. I'm I'm op only open by appointment only. I mostly um, I mostly grow plants for my clients right now, but I'm actually hoping to to open as a retail nursery within the next couple of years or so. But I have, I have a certain number of, of plants available there. Um, and again, you know, see what shows up on your property anyway, because the be best source of native plants are the ones that want to grow that are already in your neighborhood that will make an appearance in your, in your own property. Okay, well thank you for, thank you for, for listening. I'd be happy to answer questions or. Yeah, I think you said this was interactive, so if anyone has a question about your own yard and the plant from what she's just gone over. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> you have said about native healthy invasive at bitter streets. Oh, how yeah. is there a way to eradicate from the <laughs> There are ways. There are many different ways. It really depends on the situation. I mean, Freddie can tell you about Breakneck Hill, which up, up until, what, 10 years ago was the worst infestation of, of bittersweet that is ever Metro seen West. in Metro West. So it's, um, I mean, it's, 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 it will climb trees. If you have it climbing trees, probably the best thing is to just cut the, cut the vines right at the base where they, where they, where they root. Um, but they will re-sprout if you don't get the roots out. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy um, with, without using herbicides. Um, but it's, it's well worth putting the effort in um, because I, when we first bought our property 15 years ago, every single tree, I mean on, on three acres, was practically engulfed in bittersweet. And we, we worked on eradicating those. Um, we cut them off at the base. We tried to get rid of all the roots. We got rid of most of them. There are still some that still re-sprout every year because they're lodged under rocks and almost impossible to get out. Um, and we just keep on top of those. Um, but it really is worth the effort of getting rid of them um, because they will kill trees. I mean, they will bring trees down. Um, not to mention they just completely obliterate any chance of other, other natives growing in that area. Um, but I mean, without herbicides, it's, it's manual labor, cutting them and getting those roots right out of the ground, all the roots, every bit. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yep. So I've been slowly switching over to natives, but I have plenty of non-natives living in my gardens. And the hummingbirds come in and happily enjoy the bee balm and all of the plants later in the summer. 
But my early flowering plants were the catamint, which is not native. Catamint, yeah, catamint. right. And I have yep. like, I have some. Uh, so what is the earliest native hummingbird plant? Probably red columbine. Yep, which is blooming right around now. Um, it's it's kind of interesting because hummingbirds they they often show up in April. Um, the males show up in April, and, and and there's really not much blooming around then. Um, but what they what the hummingbirds will often use is sapsucker holes too. Um, in, in birch trees or maybe hickory trees, but especially birch trees. Sapsucker holes, they'll, they'll drink nectar from there. Well, that was actually the question. So we have plenty of holes, and we have the hickory, and we have all of the places where the plenty of birds have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> There's no necessary bugs yet, or caterpillars yet, and the hummingbirds are here. I was wondering what they were feeding on. Yeah. But that answers the question. Because they're also an insect eating bird. I mean, tiny insects. <laughs> yeah, they, but like they something like 90% of their diet is insects, which oh. most people don't know, which is why a friend of mine who had um, hummingbird feeders and had hummingbirds there all the time, so much so that um, she had an office window around the back of the house and the feeder was on the side. And if the feeder was empty, it would come around to where she was working in the office to let her know. Uh -huh. And I thought that was BS, but it's sorry, um, it's true. I mean, I've heard from other people that they will actually be that interactive. She had the yard sprayed for mosquitoes, and then she never will again. The hummingbirds were gone, and um, for months, and they came back after um, the insects came back. So. We're not aware. We just think that the flowers for the birds, right, um, for hummingbirds. But they're they're an insect eater, and there's plenty of insects out there now, you know. Yeah. But for so for plant early native for the insects. So yeah. So that my question I answers both of my questions. Is like we have plenty of insects happening. Yeah. I tend to assume that the hummingbirds are more going for the flowers. Like yeah. The chickadees are happy. The wrens are happy. Everybody's happy eating all the little bugs. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the hummers, they use the flowers, the nectar is, is their fuel, you know, that's their, the, they eat the bugs for the protein, um, but the, 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 the flowers give them the nectar, which is what makes, you know, they're sugar junkies, you know, that's what, keep, that's what, what, what keeps them flying. Um, but the, the red columbine, also the early phlox, um, so the wild blue phlox, they love phlox, flowers. Um, there's a, and there are a couple, there's phlox divaricata, there's phlox stalinifera. Um, and they all have those same phlox tubular flowers, so that's another early bloomer for them. Um, yeah, phlox and, and red columbine, that's what you want. Mm. So, was any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a patch of um, ivy, I don't know if it's English ivy, and I read recently that that's now considered an invasive. If I wanted to remove it, what would be a good ground cover to replace it with? Is it in a woodland set situation? Um, yes, it's on a front sloping yard, very rocky. It's under three um, white oaks. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, it's yeah the English ivy. So if it's spreading over, you know, as a ground cover, um, the, the 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 plants that would grow in that kind of situation: Solomon seal, foam flower, um, um, any of the woodlands, probably wild ginger too. Those would all be plants that would grow in, in shady spots under oaks. Um, oaks are, oaks are uh, maybe the low bush blueberries too would grow in, in, in that kind of uh, situation. Uh, let me think. That's a good start, thank you. Yeah, that's a couple suggestions for you. Yeah. Sweet woodruff is not native, no. is it? No. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> it's a well-used ground cover for shade. Um, I've heard people say it's kind of invasive. I, I consider it on a par with, um, with vinca in that it will spread and cover an area, vinca not being, vinca being periwinkle. Um, yeah, it is. It is easier to remove than vinca, yeah. It grows in the same kind of locations, but it's not native. I've been, actually, I've been battling it in my front yard for many years along with Vinca. So I'm not sure who's gonna win that one actually. <laughs> Any other questions? Another area, um, it, it's not ivy, I've got moss, as well as dandelions and violets. What would be a good plant to replace the moss as a ground cover, like break it up and then 
my friends have said the wild strawberries would be good. Yeah, wild strawberries, that's often, you know, that's a plant, actually that's a good component of a flowering lawn too. Um, they, they will grow in shade. Um, I mean, if it's moss, then I'm, assu I'm, I'm assuming that it's pretty shady in that spot, or if it's open. I mean, the wild... Same as the oak tree, same as hanging out. Oh, right, yeah. Well, wild strawberry would grow with some sun um, there uh, instead of moss. Well, if, I mean, if there is moss growing there, then, then, you're, then you, it's, it's an indicator that you could probably... Most of those um, tapestry plants that I was talking about, um, they would grow like the foam flower, um, the Virginia bluebells, the bloodroot would probably be very happy there. The bloodroot likes sun in the morning, or you know, its its favorite spot is where it gets some morning sun, but then it's shaded for the rest of the day. Um, and the bloodroot is the bloodroot is I, I really love bloodroot. It's a it's such a nice shade ground cover, um, and it spreads. Um, actually, it's spread by ants, interestingly. So you can start with one plant. Um, the ants, the, the seeds of bloodroot are, uh, have a coating, have a fleshy coating around them called an eliosome that ants love to eat. So the ants will take the seeds of bloodroot and take them, you know, wherever their, their nest is and they'll eat the coating and then spit out the seeds and that's where you'll have bloodroot plants. So it's a nice plant. You can start, it's kind of hard to find in nurseries. Um, you would have to find that at New England Wildflower Society or a native plant nursery. But once you have one or two plants, um, you'll see that it will start to, to spread into other areas. So that's a good choice for that. The wild phlox, um, that the the uh, bishop's cap that I mentioned, that would grow, that would grow there, that will spread slowly, a little bit more slowly than foam flower. Uh, the Solomon seal, uh, um, what's it called? Star flower. Star flower is another native one, and that's one that might show up on its own in that area. Wild ginger, may apple. If it's if it's fairly moist, may apple. I I thought I had a slide for may apple. I don't know what happened to it. I didn't see the slide for may apple. Strange. Something must have happened to that. Um, but may apple is a is a is a shade um, ground cover, and it's it it's blooming just about now. It's got white flowers that are underneath the blooms, but they look like little umbrellas. The plants, and that will grow and form a nice ground cover in a in a spot where um, there's fairly damp soil. Um, it's, a, it's a plant that you want to give it its own space though. Um, you wouldn't really want to use that as a tapestry plant because it, it, it needs its own area to fill. It will fill up a space. But that's a nice, a nice shady, part shade ground cover. Have, have you ever tasted a May apple? The new, the, the new uh, Garden in the Woods book says the apples are edible. I understand yeah, that they are edible. I have never tasted it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tasted it. I do know that box turtles um, like to eat them. It's a, it's a turtle food, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but I've never tasted it. I, I don't know. I'm, yeah, yeah, I wasn't aware that it was edible until I saw the book, too. Yeah. Right. So with the edge of your lawn to the woods and the tapestry planting, given that poison ivy is also a native plant, <laughs> By yeah. encouraging and putting in more native plants, can you somehow mitigate poison ivy without? <laughs> um, can you, will any no. of them push it out ever so slightly? It'll like will bloodroot be just a little happier than the poison ivy that's coming into the lawn? Will it be happier without the poison ivy? Well, can we? Yeah. Can you know, like is there a native approach to just working with the poison ivy that might already be there? That's like by crowding it out. Yeah. I, you know, I poison that. ivy is such an opportunist plant. You know, and it grows. You know, it's 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 tough to to work with. I mean, poison ivy is actually a great bird plant. I sometimes I, I in my, some of my garden club talks, I sometimes try to shock the garden club by talking about it as a bird plant. Um, it has little fruits that are um, bird food, and they like to nest in it. But um, you know, you really don't want it intermixing with your, with your, I mean, I, I, I don't think that there's anything that would outcompete it because it's poison ivy is a vine. It will just climb up anything that it, it finds and climb right over it. Um, you know, something like may apple might, you know, might, might keep the poison ivy. I don't know. That's a good question. That's a, that's a hard question to answer because poison ivy is such a, you know, I, we spend 
a lot of time trying to remove it because of its, you know, its toxic qualities to people. Um, but in a, so in let's go back in the native setting before we all decided to interact with plants. Poison ivy was here. What balanced it out so that it wasn't an invasive? Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. You know, so like, what else could be in that yeah. environment that poison ivy lived happily over here, but May apple was here, and bloodroot was here? What offered that balance? Yeah. The bittersweet singing over the trees. What yeah. Would have been a good question. The historic solution to the eco balance of poison. Yeah, I mean, poison ivy, it's a, it's a vine, you know, so it grows, it grows in search of light um, and it climbs things. Um, so pr possibly other vines. I mean, you do see um, uh, Virginia creeper in the same, growing in the same, some same places as, as poison ivy. Um, and I think the winter, you know, the, the Virginia creeper actually probably would outcompete, uh, partially outcompete the, 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 um, the poison ivy. Um, but you know, poison ivy is—it's—it's it's one of those plants that grows on the edges of things. So if there's a woodland edge, that's its—that's its, its kind of habitat. So if you have an area that's—it th doesn't tend to grow as well in total shade. It needs that little bit of light to really get going. Um, so you know, it's not as—it's not as likely to grow, or it will—it 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 will not be as vigorous if it's in in total shade. I actually yeah. found that grass. Uh, you, you have to pull up the runners, right. so you get nitrile gloves or something like that, pull up the runners, and then uh, put down grass seed, and it, it works well enough that uh, if you get the runners, the grass, uh, the grass will uh, keep it off of the ground or something like that. So. Yeah, I mean, it does, it does travel by runners, so if you can actually get the runners, pull the runners right out of the ground, and that, you can yank them pretty easily. As you said, you need to wear, you know, a gloves or a hazmat suit or something um, but you know as you know that that's what they do they 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 they, they travel in search of light um, so you know if you can if you can if you can stop the runners from traveling that's probably you, you know your only way of, of of beating it back you know pull those runners out and then just keep keep at it um, you know, it's 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 not really a plant that grows exclu you know exclusively. It grows in and among other plants. It climbs trees, etc. So it's, you know, you don't usually see. You know, you don't usually you, you see it growing in and among other plants. That's that's, that's what it does. I don't have any easy answers for poison ivy, really, because. You know, Techno soap is very Techno good. soap, yeah. Touch um, it. That does work. If you, it does work. If you lather with check new soaps, but you can find it see this. Um, I wanted to thank Ellen. I think we're really lucky that we have um, South Pro Access Media here tonight filming, so you can watch it on South Pro Cable, but you can also, if you're not in South Pro, you can do, or don't have South Pro Cable, um, you can use uh, YouTube. They have a YouTube channel, and you can watch this. It will be available. I don't know, next week maybe. Um, Something like that. Is it live now? No, it's not. No. <laughs> and Trevor's been very, um, <laughs> he's one of my favorite uh, filmers here. One of? He's, he's always <laughs> very, <laughs> what? One of. Only one of. <laughs> well, <laughs> the. I don't want to get in trouble with the other person. Everyone who's here is always the favorite, right? But they're, they're really helpful to us in filming these programs and you can watch them again the Southboro Library for hosting us, but mostly for Ellen. Um, and I don't think I gave her enough credit on her book because I'm, I want to talk about Bringing Nature Home, which is the most amazing book. And that's the why of how to use native plants. Ellen's book is more about the how. You know, so it's a really great book. She has a couple of copies here for sale. Um, and I hope we'll be doing more programs from the Open Space Preservation Commission's new native pollinator, native plant initiative. Um, I have a page full of things that when she was talking, I want to say, oh yeah, this, and oh yeah, that. But um, she has been awesome to work with at Breakneck Hill, and the pollinator gardens there are so incredible. Um, one of the things I hope you heard tonight, dispel the myth, dispel, dispel the myth that there aren't enough 
native plants that are garden worthy to fill up your summer. I mean, she just went through so many, right? And um, they're beautiful and they are garden worthy. And um, the other thing is, in the right spot, the first garden we planted, I think, something happened and we didn't get back there. We have no water at Hill. This was 2016, that was, remember that was the drought year? They all made it. I mean, you know, people are watering. I mean, reduced water usage is a big deal in a drought um, time, right? And we might be having more of those with climate change coming up. So, I mean, it was just incredible how they, um, they survived without being watered all season as young plants. I mean, we watered them in when we planted them, but for the rest of the summer, no water, drought, and they're all still there, almost yeah. all. And the other thing is, um, we have a friend, Dawn, who is a bird and wild, you know, butterflies and plant photographer, and she goes to break Nick Hill on her lunch to go for a walk, and, you know, she does the whole property to photograph what she sees there, and um, she's an amazing talent and resource for us. And last year, as um, I got there, and she was at the pollinator garden photographing the butterflies, she turned to me and she said, darn you, Freddie, I haven't been able to get past the pollinator gardens all season because there was so much activity. <laughs> the butterflies and hummingbirds, it was just nonstop. Um, so if you plant it, they will come and we're going to have more of these programs and we're going to wrap it up now because our time is up. <laughs> thank you, Ryan. We already said thank you for the library and Ryan's been a great um, help. And we also hope next year we're going to have more of these books here at the library. But in the meantime, find our, our Facebook group and we'll be um, highlighting some of these books.